Good morning, and welcome to the FMB Corporation third quarter 2021 earnings call. All participants will be in the Sonali mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your touchtone phone. To draw your question, please press star then two. Please note, today's event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Lisa Constantine, Investor Relations. Ms. Constantine, please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to our earnings call. This conference call of FMB Corporation and the reports it files with the Securities and Exchange Commission often contain forward-looking statements and non-GAAP financial measures. The non-GAAP financial measures should be viewed in addition to and not as an alternative for our reported results prepared in accordance with GAAP. Reconciliations of GAAP to non-GAAP operating measures to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures are included in our presentation materials and in our earnings release. Please refer to these non-GAAP and forward-looking statement disclosures contained in our related materials, reports, and registration statements filed with the Security and Exchange Commission and available on our corporate website. A replay of this call will be available until Tuesday, October 26th, and the webcast link will be posted to the About Us Investor Relations section of our corporate website. I will now turn the call over to Vince Billy, Chairman, President, and CEO. Thank you, and welcome to our third quarter earnings call. Joining me today are Vince Calabrese, our Chief Financial Officer, and Gary Guerreri, our Chief Credit Officer. FMB's third quarter earnings per share was 34 cents, representing an increase of 10% on a link quarter basis and bringing year-to-date EPS to 94 cents. Our performance across our core businesses led to record revenue this quarter of 321 million, up 18% on on a linked quarter annualized basis, with strong underlying momentum visible in our loan growth, pipeline, fee income, and digital customer engagement. Let's look at each one of these core building blocks starting with loan growth. Our spot loan growth, excluding the impact of PPP forgiveness, is 8% annualized link quarter, driven by a strong pickup in lending activity in both the commercial and consumer portfolios. Spot commercial loan growth totaled 7% annualized on a linked quarter basis, with positive growth in nearly every region across our footprint, notably the Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Harrisburg, and Raleigh regions. Consumer lending grew over 8% annualized link quarter, led by increases in residential mortgages and direct installment home equity loans. As evidenced by the spot loan growth, our teams had a strong quarter and overall loan production reached record levels as the economy continues to recover. We saw healthy pipeline build and a slight increase in line utilization, with the pipeline being up nearly 12% year over year. In prior earnings calls, we indicated our expectation for improvement in loan demand, and that is now materializing. Commercial had record production in September, and the consumer pipeline jumped 27% year over year. Mortgage activity has slowed more recently because of the decline in refinance activity due to higher interest rate, due to the higher interest rate environment. In addition, revenues have decreased as margins have normalized. Overall, we are optimistic that our total loan pipeline indicate a path for sustained growth. As we have continued to execute our strategic plan, non-interest income reached a record $89 million with strong contributions from capital markets and wealth management, as well as solid SBA revenue. Our emphasis on diversifying revenue streams has become even more important during a low-rate environment. Through our efforts of enhancing our product suite and expanding our services, our non-interest income now comprises 28% of our total revenue. Our clicks to brick strategy, introduced several years ago, was designed to integrate our mobile, online, and in-branch channels for a seamless and convenient banking experience. Our philosophy of continuing to invest in technology has resulted in many industry-leading offerings including our e-store solution center, which features a retail shopping cart experience, 
our mobile app, and our website with videos and substantial digital content. After launching our new website at the beginning of last year, our website engagement has increased 13% year-to-date compared to the same period in 2020, which included increased usage due to COVID and PPP origination. The platform we built with clicks to bricks has been extremely important, driving the increase in adoption and usage of digital channels. We continue to make enhancements to provide our customers with the most flexible banking options, as demonstrated by our online application functionality that enables customers to quickly and easily apply for multiple products, including consumer deposits, credit cards, and home equity and mortgage loans. In May, we launched our digital applications for mortgages on our e-store. And since then, 61% of all applications came through our digital channels. And, those, and of those applications, approximately 46% were submitted outside of normal business hours or on the weekend. In addition, over half of our credit card applications were made digitally in the third quarter. Online applications for small business loans and deposits, as well as auto loans, will be available by year end. And next year, we plan to launch a single unified application for virtually all FMB loan and deposit products to make the shopping experience for multiple products even easier. Our new interface will reduce customers' input by eliminating redundant application fields and expand our clients' capabilities to upload information in a secure portal to expedite approvals. Broader use of e-signature and automated documentation and disclosures will also be added over time. FMB recently introduced a chatbot, which will apply artificial intelligence and automation to assist our customer service employees in supporting our customers. The chatbot will identify policies and procedures and provide recommended scripting to address the top 100 frequently asked questions. We are excited about both the current and upcoming enhancements to our digital platform, which will continue to drive increased client engagement and client acquisition and improve our operating efficiency while differentiating FMB in the marketplace. With that, I will turn the call over to Gary to discuss our asset quality position. Gary? Thank you, Vince, and good morning, everyone. Our credit portfolio ended the third quarter very well positioned following continued positive results across all of our key credit metrics. This solid performance was marked by further improvement in the level of delinquency and non-performing loans, reductions in rated credits, and low net losses for both the quarterly and year-to-date periods. Additionally, improving trends across the broader economy and government stimulus have further contributed to these favorable results, including deferrals, which have reached an immaterial level of only 0.2% of total loans. Let's now review some of the highlights for the third quarter. The level of delinquency excluding triple P balances ended September at a very solid 71 basis points, a nine BIP improvement on a linked quarter basis, reflecting a notable improvement in non-accruals within the commercial book. The level of NPLs and Oreo improved to end the quarter at 49 basis points, representing a nine basis point reduction from the prior quarter's X triple P level. The reduction in NPLs during the quarter totaled 18 million, and when compared to the year ago period when NPLs had reached their peak, declined by $68 million, representing a solid 38% year over year reduction. Net charge-offs for the quarter were very low at 1.6 million, or three basis points annualized, while year-to-date net charge-offs were solid at seven basis points on an annualized basis. We recognized a $1.8 million net benefit in the provision during the quarter following these improvements in our credit quality position. This resulted in a gap reserve position that was down one basis point to stand at 1.41%, 1 
with the X triple P reserve decreasing 6 bips to stand at 1.45%. Our NPL coverage position further improved ending September at a very solid level of 317% following the noted reductions in NPLs during the quarter. Our total ending reserve position, inclusive of acquired unamortized discounts, totaled 1.56%. In closing, we are very pleased with the position of our portfolio moving into the final quarter of the year and the continued progress we've made to further reduce non-performing and rated credit levels. We remain vigilant and attentive to any emerging risks in both the broader economy and within the markets in which we and our customers operate. With the continued supply chain and labor disruptions, elevated input costs, and the evolving nature of the virus, our approach to managing and growing our loan portfolio in this highly competitive environment remains balanced and consistent with our time-tested credit principles that have served us well throughout the various economic cycles. This foundation of sound and consistent underwriting timely and comprehensive management of risk, and selectively pursuing opportunities that fit our desired credit profile will support our future growth objectives as we move ahead. I will now turn the call over to Vince Calabrese, our Chief Financial Officer, for his remarks. Thanks, Gary. Today I will discuss our financial results for the third quarter and provide guidance for the fourth quarter. Overall, this was a strong quarter, and we were very pleased with the results. Our continued strategic focus on diversified fee income contribution drove non-interest income to a record $88.9 million, up $9.1 million, or 11% linked quarter, leading to record pre-provision net revenue of $138 million on an operating basis, and a return on tangible common equity reaching nearly 17%. Our tangible book value per share reached $8.42 an increase of $0.22, cents or 2.6% on a linked quarter basis. Let's walk through the financials in greater detail, starting with the highlights on slide 4. Third quarter EPS increased to $0.34, cents, up $0.03 cents over the prior quarter and $0.09 cents from the year-ago quarter. On a linked quarter basis, total revenue reached a record of $321 million, an increase of $13.6 million, or 4.4%, and drove net income available to common stockholders to a record $109.5 million, an increase of $10 million, or 10.2%. When excluding Triple P, which is more reflective of the underlying loan growth, period end total loans increased $463 million, or 7.8% annualized on a linked quarter basis, with commercial loans and leases increasing $289 million, or 7.4% annualized, and consumer loans increasing $173 million, or 8.5% annualized, building on the strong growth generated in the second quarter of this year. As Vince said, this loan growth was across the footprint, with production levels 17% higher than last quarter and 45% higher than third quarter 2020. Let's continue with the balance sheet on slide 7. Reported average loans and leases totaled $24.7 billion, with average commercial loans and leases decreasing $942 million, which was entirely due to lower average triple P balances, as we saw an acceleration of forgiveness and ended the quarter at $694 million. On the deposit side, average deposits totaled $30.8 billion, an increase of $0.3 billion or 1.1%, primarily in non-interest bearing deposit accounts. We continue to see a shift in customers' preferences for more liquid accounts in a low interest rate environment, as well as maintaining larger deposit account balances than before the pandemic. In addition, we have also seen an acceleration of deposit accounts open digitally. Turning to slide 8, net interest income total $232.4 million, an increase of $4.5 million or 2% from the prior quarter. Including the triple P contribution and purchase accounting accretion, net interest income increased $2.8 million, or 1.4%, reflecting an increase in average loans, a more favorable funding mix, and lower deposit costs. We are expecting a slight tailwind for net interest income 
excluding Triple P contribution as a significant portion of our loan growth occurred near the end of the quarter. Reported net interest margin increased two basis points to 272, reflecting higher Triple P contribution of 23 basis points and a five basis point benefit from acquired loan discount accretion, which was offset by higher average cash balances that reduced the net interest margin 26 basis points. Excess cash balances grew to $3.7 billion at quarter end, a 45% increase from June 30th. When excluding these higher excess cash balances, acquired loan discount accretion, and triple P impact, net interest margin declined two basis points. Now let's look at non-interest income and expense on slides 9 and 10. Record non-interest income totaled $88.9 million increasing 9.1 million, or 11.4%, from the prior quarter, with broad contributions from each of our fee-based businesses. Capital markets income increased 5.5 million, reflecting very strong swap activity, with solid contributions from commercial lending activity, as well as contributions from loan syndications, debt capital markets, and international banking. Service charges increased 2 million, reflecting seasonally higher customer activity volumes, SBA volumes and average transaction sizes continue to be strong, with $2 million in premium income included in other non-interest income. Also included in other non-interest income was a $2.2 million recovery on a previously written off other asset. Reported non-interest expense increased $1.7 million, or 0.9%, to $184.2 million this quarter. When excluding non-operating items, non-interest expense increased $3.4 million, or 1.9%. On an operating basis, the increase was driven by salaries and employee benefits increasing $2.9 million, or 2.8%, due to production and performance-related commissions and incentives consistent with record levels of total revenue, which was driven by diversified strong contributions from our fee-based businesses. Overall, we produced a strong quarter and believe we are well positioned for the fourth quarter. Now let's turn to fourth quarter guidance on page 12. We expect triple P forgiveness to be 300 to $500 million. With the triple P loan balances decreasing, we are estimating a range of 10 to $15 million for the triple P contribution to net interest income compared to the third quarter's contribution of $27 million. Excluding Triple P contribution, we expect net interest income to be up low single digits relative to the third quarter. Continuing to benefit from our diversified revenue base, we expect non interest income to be in the high 70s to 80 million for the fourth quarter. Non interest expense is expected to be around 180 million on an operating basis, which is subject to normal production related incentives and commissions as we close out the year. We expect the effective tax rate to be between 19 and 19.5%. Lastly, I would like to quickly review our full year 2021 guide given last quarter. We believe we will meet our loan growth guidance of mid single digits. We expect full year gap revenue to be up year over year, which will impact the production related incentives and commissions, bringing compensation related expenses slightly higher. Full year provision is expected to continue a strong performance with incremental provision dependent on the level of loan growth. Overall, we believe we will finish 2021 with solid earnings. With that, I will turn the call back to Vince. Thanks, Vince. We're pleased to announce that Howard Bank integration is currently underway, and overall, everything is moving very smoothly. We are impressed with Howard's employees and strong customer base and look forward to working with you. We are still expecting to close the transaction in early 2022. FMB was once again recognized for our best-in-class digital strategy, Clicks to Bricks. We recently received a prestigious national award for our mobile banking experience. Our continued productive investment in our top mobile offering will soon have a new look and feel with chat support, a credit center, mobile statements, and FMB's proprietary mobile e-store enabling product, service, and financial literacy to be available within the mobile app. 
Other features include Snap to Pay, which enables customers to add a payee by taking a picture of their bill, and FNB Express Deposit, where for a fee, select customers will be offered immediate funds availability for mobile deposited items. Lastly, I'd like to offer a sincere thank you to all FNB employees. This quarter's performance demonstrates the dedication and drive of our employees. It is because of each person's commitment to FNB and our clients that we have been able to achieve record quarterly revenue. Our employees are the heart of our organization, and I want to thank them for their continued hard work. With that, I'll turn the call over to the operator for questions. Operator? Yes, thank you. At this time, we will begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star, then one, on your touchstone phone. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble the roster. And this morning's first question comes from Frank Schiraldi with uh, Piper Sandler. Good morning. Um, hey, Frank. All right. I just wondered if you could, Vince, you mentioned the $3.7 billion in, in excess cash. Just um, wondered if you could talk a little bit about your thoughts on, on working that down um, over time. Uh, you know, do you expect most of these deposits to stick around? What is the expectation for, you know, maybe securities builds, just, just trying to accrete this to the bottom line? Yeah, no, I would say, you know, the, the deposits – definitely have been very sticky, the triple P deposits, and you know, we've continued to have a deposit growth every quarter going back to the first quarter of 2020. Um, you know, the goal with the cash level is really, the primary goal is to deploy it to fund loans as we move forward from here. There's opportunities with the Howard uh, merger, once we close that, to put probably half a billion of that to work um, related to their borrowing. So that's an opportunity there. On the investment portfolio, you know, we're basically going to reinvest cash flows. We reinvested a little bit more this quarter. Um, you know, during the quarter, we reinvested $621 million on cash flows of 453 So there were some opportunities there to, to put some money to work. Um, but, you know, reinvestment rates at 113 are better than the 15 we're earning on the cash, for sure, um, but still kind of running lower than the runoff rate of, of 190 in the portfolio. So, you know, we may see the securities portfolio go up a little bit from here. Um, we might pre-invest a little bit related to um, Howard Securities portfolio that we get between now and actually closing that. But um, the primary goal will be um, put it to fund loans and then using cash for some of the transactions in the first quarter. And in the first quarter, Frank, we take a full look at our whole balance sheet to see if there's other opportunities maybe to deploy some of that cash in um, any other borrowings that we have on our balance sheet. Okay. Um, and then just on, on Howard, I um, wondered if you could remind us, um, you know, uh, with the timing of the cost saves being extracted, what, what sort of accretion uh, we should expect from that in uh, 2022 specifically? And, and would that include things like you mentioned the uh, borrowings that uh, you could use the cash for? Yeah, I guess, you know, the overall accretion, if you go back to what we announced, when we did the model was 4% overall. That's kind of on a full year, fully phased in basis, Frank. And when we give guidance in January, we'll give, you know, we'll refresh everything as far as, you know, where they come on the balance sheet and, um, you know, all the different drivers for the full year. But that's really the most current figure we have. Okay. Um, have you, just, just lastly on that, just uh, in terms of, um, the cost saves timing. I know you've talked about in the past. I just don't recall uh, when you expect those to be uh, fully phased in by. Yeah, Frank. Uh, we, we mentioned the first full year we expect to get 85% of the cost saves um, by the end of the year. So we get a big chunk of, chunk of that up front um, with some of the actions we'll take, and then throughout the, the year we'll kind of bring them in. And then, like I said, we'll get to 100% in the, in the second year. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Thank you. And the next question comes from uh, Jared Shaw with Wells Fargo. Hi. Good morning. This is Timor Braziller filling in for Jared. Maybe, maybe starting on the loan growth this quarter, um, two consecutive nice quarters for commercial loan growth. I hear your commentary on the utilization rates, 
spike up a little bit, uh, gaining some momentum there. I guess, can you talk through what the utilization rate change was during the quarter? And then as you look at loan growth, kind of X, the PPP headwind, um, this new momentum that you're gaining, how sustainable is this into 22? And maybe can we get an early look at what your expectation is for 22 loan growth? Well, I think this is Vince to Lee. Uh, we'll cover the 22 loan growth when we give guidance uh, for next year. So I think we're going to dive into that right now. But if you look at the past two quarters, we've had pretty good uh, growth across our geographies. If you recall, and we've stated for some time now that our plan was to expand into multiple geographies where we could create enough scale to compete effectively and drive loan growth. Uh, you know, with geographic diversity, and I, I think that's happening. We're seeing, you know, growth coming from various parts of our footprint, which covers the seven-state area. So we're seeing, you know, some good opportunities in the Carolinas. You know, Charleston's doing very well. Uh, we expanded into Charleston a few years ago. We have a great team there. Uh, Raleigh and Charlotte are performing pretty well. We've got uh, a team in Greensboro that continues to, to perform well over time. And then, you know, our traditional markets, the Mid-Atlantic region with our expansion into Washington, D.C., and uh, the Baltimore market uh, contributing, Pittsburgh contributing, and, you know, Cleveland uh, is picking up momentum. So, you know, we, we feel pretty good about where we sit from a utilization perspective. You know, we've, we've seen a little bit of uh, increased borrowing on uh, credit facilities that support uh, manufacturing and, and other areas. I think there's still a lot of cash sitting on the sidelines and we are still, you know, many of our clients are still experiencing, you know, supply chain disruption which really prevents them from, you know, building inventory positions. And then you have the issues with commodity pricing uh, for certain borrowers who, you know, basically are on the sidelines because of the higher cost of raw materials. They, they're not stockpiling raw materials for projects. I mean, it's pretty evident as, as you read about various aspects of the economy, uh, but that's that's purely reflected in line utilization. And then in terms of growth, you know, the one thing I will say is that you know the pipelines have been fairly robust. Uh, we did close quite a bit uh, in the last quarter, so we're rebuilding the pipeline. The pipeline, as I stated in my comments, is up double digit year over year, so we're up optimistic about that in the commercial space. On the consumer side, you know, we have a very strong pipeline. I, you know, that's up 27% year over year, so it appears that consumers have been borrowed. Gary, if you could just comment on, you know, what we funded and uh, line utilization and, you know, what we have in commitments that are yeah. out there. Sure, Vince, thanks. Uh, in terms of uh, commercial line utilization, specifically to, uh, to the quarter, we saw a 1.8% increase, so it went from 32, a little over 32 to 34%, so almost 2%. So that was uh, that was a positive move upward, and uh, touched on some of the things that that Vince mentioned in the activity. And, and that all said, you know, the the, the supply chain issues and, and pressures across the economy are real. So that is that is holding some of that, uh, you know, at bay a bit. But uh, as it was good to see that that increase during the quarter. Uh, the the other thing that I did want to mention was, you know, as as we talk about the solid loan growth that we did experience, uh, we we even saw some significant unfunded closings uh, and future loan growth to come. Uh, there there were about a half a billion dollars of loans that were closed and remain unfunded uh, during the third quarter. Uh, and you know those those fundings are uh, split between C and I as well as CRE, and you know that'll fund up over the over the next 12, 18, uh, you know the tail end of it over 24 months. Uh, but that's a that's a really nice headwind for us from a loan growth standpoint as as we look ahead. Okay. Thank you for the color. Um, Maybe just switching gears and looking at some of the technology initiatives that are 
either already implemented or coming online over the course of next, uh, the, the remainder of this year and into next year. Uh, can you just remind us what your strategy is as far as partnering with third parties versus building out some of the platforms in-house? Um, and as you're starting to go more towards a AI style um, a approach for driving applications, is that going to be, is part of the underwriting going to be uh, handled by AI as well? And, and if so, maybe talk through that process as well. Yeah, our, our approach is, is to control the interface. So from a proprietary perspective, we're developing the interface with the client. So our eStore Solution Center that I mentioned is very exciting for us, and it opens the door for us to reach millions of customers across our footprint where we may not have physical locations. And they can actually go into the website, uh, pick a product, put it in a shopping cart, put multiple products in the shopping cart, and then check out uh, you know, by processing multiple applications. And you know what we're doing is we're continuing to refine that. We're continuing to add to that offering. We are working with a variety of technology companies, both large and small, to partner with to make that experience better. We are developing a uh, proprietary omni-channel application, which will permit customers to open multiple uh, products on a single application. And that's scheduled to be uh, launched mid next year. Um, I, I think that you know as we move forward, we just added a couple of other products. We added loan products. We stood up the mortgage uh, origination platform. So we've opened about 65% of our total application in the mortgage business, for example, digitally, which includes the ability to upload information in a portal and process transactions. So you know that's all going extremely well and you know I, we, we launched uh, just recently we launched the ability to do consumer loans uh, we're going to stand up uh, small business loans with a portal to upload information to help streamline processing so all of that's being built out on the front end we're partnering with various uh, entities large and small you know Pfizer in some respects and then smaller uh, fintech companies to help uh, deliver the products, but they're being delivered within our framework. So our strategy is to create the interface, control the interface, build out the digital bank, make it as easy as possible to use, and keep refining it and changing it. And, you know, I, I think it's been extraordinarily uh, well received by our customers, and we've gotten, uh, and we've received a national award for the eStore from BCX, which is you know, a pretty prominent award in the mobile space. And when we incorporate that eStore into our mobile application, which is coming out in November, that will open the channel up to even more users. So, you know, web traffic's up considerably. I mean, if you look at, if you look at what we've done, I mean, we've actually uh, been able to, to increase uh, usage in our mobile with our mobile app on a year-over-year -year basis, really looking at the first quarter of 20 versus the first quarter of 21, because that takes the pandemic into account. Right. So you know, basically, we're up 40% in mobile banking usage. We're up 25% in web traffic. We're up 29% in online banking usage. 60%, 62% in Zelle person-to-person. Usage. We're averaging about our website also has the ability to schedule appointments through that shopping experience with various bankers or professionals within our company. We're, we're averaging about 800 appointments per month. So you know it's it's been sustained. It's, it's peaked at 2,700 during the pandemic and then has, has come down as people have greater access to the branches. But it's still been uh, fairly robust. And we're averaging about uh, 2,000 deposit applications per month through that site. So I think of all the things we talk about here, that's the most exciting uh, part of what we're doing. And then on the AI side, we're using analytics for a whole bunch of reasons. We developed a team. We have both the capabilities self-developed to process large quantities of data. So we have the people and we have the infrastructure and, and data management and a centralized hub 
to, to take information from disparate applications and process it fairly quickly. Millions and millions and millions of uh, bits of information can be processed on our systems by our people. And then we have the data analytics team who works with marketing, they work with credit, they work with uh, finance to, uh, to utilize artificial intelligence to improve efficiency and to, to really understand product usage and position products for sale within that e-store and within the company. So all of that's going on. We're also using it, another example would be the chatbot that we developed. And you know, I, I think that you know, our people are, are pretty much uh, plugging in to the technology that we built out and thinking of ways to use it to, to drive efficiency and revenue growth. So very exciting stuff, and I'll stop there. I'm sorry I went on pretty long, but. Uh, that's, that's good color, Vince, thank you. Yep. Thank you. And the next question comes from Michael Perito with uh, KBW. Hey, good morning, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. Morning, Mike. Yeah, Mike. I just have a couple follow-ups. I wanted to stick on the technology side for a second, Vince. I was curious if, if you guys have taken a look or have any anything incremental you could share about kind of how the, the unit economics of, of, of growing customers is changing as you do more digitally versus kind of the branches historically and and maybe kind of weave that into, you know, the, the on the cost side, I know you guys aren't talking guidance next year yet, but, you know, the efficiency ratio has been fairly flat, and, and you guys have managed to grow revenues a bit more than expenses. I mean, is that a dynamic that you think some of these investments can expand moving forward, or, or do you really need rates at this point to, to kind of drive that efficiency ratio down further? No, I, I think that, that those investments in technology will help us do two things as we move forward. It'll help us generate revenue more efficiently because we don't have the infrastructure, the legacy infrastructure that we had with a huge branch system, for example. We've cut uh, over 100 branches since I've been here and have still experienced growth. In some markets, we've, we've closed branches and because of our digital offering, we've actually grown deposits and loans. So, you know, that's to me a clear indication that you know, our cost to originate is much lower uh, than it has been historically moving forward. And then the growth that we've seen, you know, both from a depository and, and loan perspective, is really aided by those investments in technology. And it's only going to get better as we become better, as we refine that delivery channel and, and improve it, it'll become easier for consumers to engage us and and you know, get the products and services that they want in a very convenient way. And you know, marrying that with the branch people, you know, with our clicks to brick strategy, it's to integrate the branches into that e-delivery channel so that we have kind of concierge out there that know where people are shopping or what they're looking at online, and then they're able to help facilitate sales within the branches. So I think it's all finally starting to come together. We've spent you know, two strategic planning cycles, uh, investing in these areas. Uh, you know, a lot of that investment is behind us. I mean, obviously there's more to come, but, you know, a lot of the heavy lifting is behind us and it's embedded in our run rate. We've said that all along. We've not shied away from focusing on that because I truly believe that's the future of the industry and we need to be prepared to compete in that space effectively. And I, I think we've done a great job, our people done a phenomenal job of keeping us in the game. Plus, I would just add the efficiency opportunity to drive all the businesses through that channel. We've invested a lot, like Vince said, getting each business, trust, insurance, you know, the wealth business, all through that channel brings in more revenue, more opportunity for customers, helps to drive costs down and efficiency ratio. So that's another element of it, too. Yep. Helpful. Thank you. And then on the non-interesting side, uh, I know you guys provided the guide for the fourth quarter. I wanted to talk about two line items specifically, though. I was wondering if you could maybe give us a little bit more color around the, the, the service charge line, which, which saw a really nice rebound. Is, is, is there anything more to that than, than just, you know, kind of a rebound of, of economic activity? And I guess number one. And number two, on the capital market side, um, Anything new from a product or sales process going on within that, or, or should we expect that line? I mean, maybe not twelve and a half million, but 
to be fairly robust if your if your commercial growth you know continues to be positive moving forward. Well, there's two things there. You know, in the you know when you look at uh, fees related to depository transactions, we're really growing treasury management fee income. We've picked up you know because of the investments we've made and the new client acquisition strategy, we're getting uh, we're gaining momentum in the fee space uh, for providing treasury management services to commercial clients. So, you know, a good bit of that growth is attributable to that area. And then on the flip side, on capital markets, when you look at what we've done from a capital markets perspective, we've continued to build out our capabilities. We have a a very uh, good team that focuses on uh, syndicating uh, both CNI and CRE uh, loans, so we get paid uh, to syndicate. Uh, we have a debt capital markets group that's taken off, and you know we've done a number of transactions. You know where we're able to participate in bond economics uh, because of our debt capital markets capability that we just completed and built out. We're focusing on municipal finance. We've received the approvals that we need to move forward with uh, generating fee income and public finance. We have a fairly robust government lending program, so that goes hand in hand. Uh, so our participation in uh, bond economics within the public finance space will be important moving forward. And uh, obviously, you know, the derivatives area is the core, uh, you know, pretty important core piece of, of what we offer. And we have continued to add good people across our footprint to help us partic- participate in that activity as well. So capital markets is really a combination of all of that. And then I, I can't, I have to mention our uh, FX capabilities. You know, we're, we're able to compete very effectively against some of the largest players in the country and have won business in the upper middle market, large corporate space because of our capabilities in FX. That was another area which we consider part of capital markets because they do hedging and spot transactions for, for customers. So, you know, all of that together. Uh, provides us with a, a good, strong, diverse source of revenue streams within that capital markets business. Got it. Helpful, color. Thank you guys for taking my questions. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. And the next question comes from Russell Gunther with the A. Davidson. Hey, good morning, guys. Hi, Russell. Just uh, circle back to the loan growth conversation for a second, and you'll appreciate the mid-single digit reiteration. You know, it assumes a, about a like amount for the fourth quarter to get there. And then Gary's reminder about the consistent underwriting throughout cycles. But, you know, the strong growth of the past couple quarters, that high single digit annualized number, the growth of your markets you've moved into over the past few years with LPOs and m and I mean, is there any reason – just bigger picture going forward, we shouldn't begin to think about F&B as a mid to high single digit grower rather than mid single digits. And, you know, what would keep you from feeling more comfortable towards the higher end of that type of range? Well, historically, we have been a high single digit performer, you know, for a long period of time prior to the pandemic. If you looked at the, uh, the average growth rate for the company, we were, you know, double digits. Uh, including M&A over a sustained period of time, and high single-digit organic uh, loan growth. You know, we stripped out the, the M&A contribution and looked at it on an organic basis. We used to report that out to the street. So, you know, as we move through this cycle, the disruption that we've experienced, which was fairly substantial uh, given the pandemic, I, I think we're going to return to those levels. And it's, it's certainly uh, doable given the investments we've made in our platform. You know, if you really look at how we're structured for a $40 billion bank to have the opportunity to compete in 10 fairly large markets, right, you know, where we have a substantial share in those, we consider them, you know, mid-sized cities in, in the southeast and the mid-Atlantic and the northeast. You know, we have, we have the potential to do that, and we, we're able to do that and still maintain our credit underwriting standards. I mean, we we could grow even faster if we we didn't have a great deal of discipline. I'll let Gary comment further on that because he's on the front end of this stuff. So I don't, Gary, if you want to 
comment. That yeah, made. thanks, Vince. I mean, we're seeing continued uh, opportunities at a very good pace. Uh, the diversification of the markets, we think, is absolutely critical. And Russell, to your question, um, you know, the the impact of COVID, uh, you know, has us uh, from a guidance standpoint, you know, in that in that mid single range. As you can see from the last couple of quarters, growth has been strong, uh, you know, in that in that eight plus percent range. So, you know, that's that's kind of where we like to be. That's where we we expect to be, and and I think you'll see that, you know, as as we move forward and, and put some of these issues behind us. That all said, you know, there are supply chain issues that are real. Everyone knows that. Uh, inflationary pressures, you know, labor issues, uh, and availability, uh, as well as cost. So, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of headwinds in the economy that, you know, need to continue to be worked through. Uh, but, you know, we're very confident in our ability to, to grow the loan book, and, you know, we, we feel good about, uh, you know, what we've been able to produce the last couple quarters. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Understood on the growth trajectory. And then just uh, one kind of tangential follow-up. So, you know, the recent M&A announcement, prior to that, you've been pretty successful with the LPO strategy. As you think about the model going forward, you know, how do you balance or how do you want to balance LPO versus M&A and any particular market that you want to move into or scale up in and what's the best way to go about it? Yeah, our, our focus, as I've said, you know, historically, sometimes what I say is taken out of context, but I'll try to be really clear. We, we're really focused on organic growth, on making sure the company's positioned to grow to provide benefits to the shareholders. So, you know, when an M&A opportunity comes up like Howard, sure, you know, we're going to look at it. Uh, we're going to measure it against other opportunities to invest capital. And if we think it makes strategic sense for us to to pursue that type of an opportunity, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do it in the most uh, shareholder-friendly way we can. So, you know, returns on capital are important to us. You know, we've historically, you know, we've said that repeatedly. We don't have tons of excess capital. Uh, you know, our, our strategy has been to grow tangible book value per share and, and maintain high returns on uh, tangible common equity. So we. We continue to focus on that, and I think the digital strategy and our investments in the digital platform really gives us a considerable amount of upside as an organization. If we were a technology company without any revenue, people would be valuing us extraordinarily high based upon the potential alone. So I, I look at that and say, you know, how do we deploy capital? Um, we're you know, we're going to be very cautious about what we do. Uh, if M&A comes about, it would have to be something, you know, on the smaller end that, that fits into our footprint that helps us gain efficiency or pick up clients so we can use our investments in technology to drive revenue uh, within that customer base. And that's, that's, the, that's the focus of the company. Great. Well, that's it for me, guys. Thanks for taking my question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Russell. Thank you. And the next question. Research Partners. Yeah, uh, good morning, gentlemen. Um, curious, uh, I can ask my questions to be asked and answered, but uh, uh, Vince, maybe as you look across uh, the various geographies and markets, are you seeing any difference in terms, differential in terms of loan pricing or opportunities that uh, stand out more than others? Thanks. It, it's extraordinarily competitive across the board. I, I know everybody says that. And I tell my people, I've heard that my whole career, so please don't tell me that. You just have to win, right? So you have to deliver the best products at the right time, structure the deal appropriately so we're all secure and the borrower gets what they need, and, you know, accommodate them. So, you know, it, it's an extraordinarily competitive environment. I think there's spots where, you know, the pricing is a little better, but it's not materially different. And if you look at Cleveland, for example, which everybody says is a lower growth market, theoretically should have less competition, it's loaded with huge competitors, uh, U.S. Bank, Chase, uh, Huntington, Key Bank, PNC. Uh, so, you know, that market is as competitive as Charlotte, which is loaded with large competitors. So 
We have to execute better. We have to stay focused on customers. This is a, still a people business, so we have to make sure that our brand is aware. People are aware of our brand in the marketplace, and you know they basically uh, have the right people in those markets to, to drive growth. If you look at our strategy from a visibility perspective, you know we we went in negotiated uh, opportunities to name buildings in Greensboro, Raleigh, Charlotte. We have a thirty-story office building with our name in it in Charlotte. You know it's a very cost-effective way for us to promote our brand because we consolidated into that building and moved you know multiple locations into one building and actually the you know the occupancy expenses a push right or maybe even slightly better. Uh, we did that in a number of markets you know, because we bought you know, smaller banks and then merged them together. We bought a big bank that hadn't merged all the operations. So we elevated our profile in all of these cities without on a de novo basis a very good, we've optimized the delivery channel from a retail and commercial banking perspective in those markets. So long runway. And you know, I, I think that uh, we're very well positioned so I, hopefully I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Stephen Zink. Good morning, this is Samuel Vargo from Brody Preston. Hey there, how are question, you? How are you? Uh, my first question uh, is around uh, some of the FA job borrowings um, that you currently hold on the balance sheet. Uh, I understand that you're uh, planning on using some of the liquidity to pay down borrowings on the Howard side, but I wanted to ask, uh, according to the last queue, there's about $1.1 uh, that was swapped and was supposed to mature this year. And so I just wanted to ask a little bit about what the repricing dynamic is around the, the new borrowing re replacing the old ones. Yeah, I can tell you that the, the home loan borrowings, we have 300 million more to mature in the next four months. There's 200 million in November with that 30 basis points, and then another 100 million in I think it's January, February at 154. So once those two mature, we'll have 930 million left at, at 223, and then that piece there we'll evaluate as part of the kind of first quarter of the merger and really look at our whole balance sheet. So. That's what will be left after that 300 million matures in the next four months. Understood. Thank you. Um, and then moving over to the fee income, um, thank you for the color you provided on just all the different moving pieces there. Um, so I wanted to ask for just a little bit of clarification here. Uh, the the elevated um, swap fee income uh, is that kind of a reset to a higher run rate? Or is there is that more of a one time in nature for this quarter and it's going to step back down? And if so, is there any corresponding offset on the expense side for that? Well, I would say if you look, I mean, it's a, definitely a record quarter for us. If you look over the last seven quarters, we've had three quarters that have had a north of 10, 10 million, and, and another quarter that had a 12 handle to it. So, um, I mean, it's a little lumpy because of the, the capital markets, the derivative side of that business. Um, but I think to, to Vince's point, with all the businesses we've invested in, international syndication, and then the new um, debt capital markets capabilities we have, which has already added a half a million so far year to date in, in its first year of existence, I think that'll um, supplement it as we go forward. Um, but it'll be lumpy. I mean, our guidance for the fourth quarter doesn't have 12 and a half in it, but it still has a pretty strong number um, in, baked into that forecast north of where we were running in, in, in the second quarter. Got it. Thank you. And then a quick last one. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you could tell me what, how much uh, of the PPP, PPP fees are left uh, to be recognized. Yeah, there's $20 million, $20 million worth of fees left, and then you'll have interest income on the remaining balance. $700 million that's left. There's $20 million of, of unaccreted fees to come in, and then you earn about a million and a half to $2 million of interest income on that over the quarter. Understood. Thank you very much for taking my questions. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question comes from Brian Martin with Jenny Montgomery. Hey, guys. Good morning. Good morning, Brian. Hey, just a couple 
quick things for me. Just on back to the PPP for just a minute. It seems like most of that gets resolved the first half of next year. I mean, you get you gave some guidance in fourth quarter that gets you know if you got 20 million left, that gets a good chunk of it. So maybe first quarter we're kind of through PPP. Is that fair? How to think about that? Yeah. I- yeah, I think so. Definitely by the middle of the year, Brian, I would, I would envision it being totally gone. Um, the pace of it, it, it moves around, right? There's clients' yeah. changes with about tax return filings and when they want to file. There, there were different tranches, too, so you have to take that into consideration. The last billion came on uh, more recently. Right? Yeah. The last tranche. Yeah. yeah, there's 576 of the 700 that's from round two. Yeah, so, so I would say, you know, I would expect that to come in over the first two quarters of next year. Okay, gotcha. Okay, all right. And then just how about Vince? Maybe just on the on the core the core margin. Can you just talk about kind of the puts and takes the next couple quarters here? I guess it, it sounds like you you mentioned a little bit of a tailwind, uh, maybe with the loan growth, but just kind of um, the, the puts and takes here in the near term on on the core margin, kind of x the you know PPP the you know, the liquidity and uh, the accretion. Yeah, I'll comment on the dollars, Brian, for net interest yeah. income. The margins just, there's too many moving parts going in different directions with yeah. excess cash yeah. on the balance sheet and everything. But if you look at the dollars, right, just I'll make a few comments here. So net interest income for the quarter right, went up four and a half million. One and a half million of that was related to Triple P and the purchase accounting was down about a half a million. Triple P was up two million. Um, so you had two million. Um, you know, one and a half, three million that was related to just kind of core loan growth. You know, the solid spot loan growth that we talked about in the second quarter and third quarter obviously contributes to that. Um, we continue to bring down the cost of interest bearing deposits. You know, we brought that down another three basis points during the quarter. So the average for the quarter was 21, and our spot as we sit here today is 18. So there's already kind of another three basis points of benefit and the interest-bearing deposit costs. And then the consumer CDs continue to roll down. We pick up about two basis points a month on the CDs as they, as they mature. Um, so if you kind of put all those pieces in there, and then you know the, the level of excess cash um, obviously is, is significant from a margin perspective, right? As you can see on that slide that, that we've added, we've reduced the margin by 26 basis points for the quarter. So I mean, as we start to deploy that, um, that affects the percentage, for sure, um, and it also obviously affects the dollars in net interest income. We're earning 15 basis points on that, so every dollar that we put to work um, for loans obviously is additive to the net interest income. So kind of that all being said is what's baked into our excluding triple P contribution, kind of being up low single digits in the fourth quarter versus the third quarter. Gotcha. Okay. All right. That's helpful. And just... Um, Maybe I just misunderstood what you guys said or didn't quite kind of get it on the loan growth side, but I get the year over year pipelines were up. When you look, it sounded like you're, you know, given the strength this quarter and the rebuilding that you're kind of going at right now, that the, is the, is, are the loan pipelines lower today than they were at the start of last quarter or a similar type of levels? Just, you know, link quarter, how did the pipelines change? It varies. It varies. The consumer pipeline is stronger, so it's up. As I said, you know, 27% is up uh, substantially. The commercial pipeline, you know, it's up year over year. On a link quarter basis, it would be down because we had a huge production. Quarter, yeah. Just absolutely yeah. huge. And as Gary indicated, there's a half a billion dollars in unfunded commitments that will fund up over time within that uh, big production period that we have. So that's how I would look at it. Commercial rebuild. Um, you know, consumer very strong, and as we move into the last quarter, you know, hopefully they balance each other out. We're able to capitalize on some of the larger opportunities we have in the commercial pipeline. Plus, you have the tailwind of the unfunded loans that will start to fund up, so that also benefits the loan growth. And and that'll carry over into next year as well, so that's not just one quarter. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then just on the, maybe one for Gary, just on the classified, I think you said the rated credits were down, Gary, just do you, can you comment on just what happened with, you know, classifieds or criticized in the quarter and then maybe just talk about um, how we should think about the reserve prospectively given, you know, how strong credit appears to be. 
Yeah, uh, continued continued positive movement across the criticized categories, um, Ryan. And you know when you when you look at when you look at this quarter, uh, similarly strong as compared to to the last quarter, uh, about a hundred and thirty million dollar reduction uh, in Q3. Uh, about sixty percent of that um, of that reduction. Uh, was classified. So continuing to be able to move classified assets off the books just in the normal course of other banks refinancing them. So our, our special assets team is continuing to take advantage of that uh, opportunity with, with the underwriting that's, that's being seen out there. Uh, so that is, uh, that is a positive move. Uh, and we'll continue to take advantage of that. Yeah, in terms of uh, your question around the the reserve, uh, you know, I mentioned uh, some of the headwinds in the economy before. Um, you know, supply chain, inflation, labor costs, and and, and those issues. Uh, you know, those are real, as I mentioned. Uh, subject to the economy staying strong uh, and and moving forward through those issues, you know, I would expect that. You know, you'll see continued uh, slight reductions in the reserve uh, and potentially normalizing as you get into late 22 and into into 23. Uh, so we'll see how the economy holds out, and we'll you know we'll continue to to manage manage that as we go forward. Naturally, loan growth comes into play there as well. So uh, yeah. something that we'll continue to to monitor on a regular basis and manage accordingly. Okay, perfect. Then maybe just one last one if I can sneak it in. Just on the on the fee income, I think the service charges have been a topic in the industry. With you know, I guess I saw the growth this quarter, but just as we think about that line item, it's it's something that continues to grow at this point, or is there something where you guys are, you know, I guess, looking at what competitors are doing on the service charge line going forward? Well, it depends on what category within the service line uh, reporting item. You know, overdrafts down. I would expect yeah. it to get the trend down. We we rolled out a product which just received certification uh, where clients can't overdraft, and it's our second best product, you know, in terms of sales performance. So, you know, I expect and I expect, you know, continued uh, pressure to make changes in that category for the industry, not just for us. Uh, so that's not an area of focus. You know, we're trying to to look for ways. To provide, you know, we call them high value fees to our customers and, and to build the revenue streams within other categories of the service charge area. So, treasury management, as I mentioned, is one area where we've consistently grown uh, double digit in that area, but it's been muted by, you know, other, other uh, contributors to that category. And we expect that to continue to grow. Uh, there are a number of other products that are rolling out. Debit card has done really well. Actually rebounded pretty nicely from the pandemic. So, you know, you're seeing interchange contribution to that category. Uh, we continue to roll out commercial cards and procurement cards for our clients. That's driving interchange fees within the category. So like our capital markets strategy, we're looking for diversification within that area. And, you know, that's that's how we would view it going forward is, you know, modest growth in that category based upon that, the execution and the diversification strategy. Perfect. Okay. That's helpful. Thanks, Vince. Thanks for taking the questions, guys. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Yep. Operator still on the line? Okay. 
Okay. Well, I'm just going to close out the call. I think we're having some technical issues. Uh, so if somebody does have a question, you know, please call us, and you know, we'll try to you know respond appropriately. But uh, thank you, everyone, for participating in the call. I think we had a great quarter. There's a lot of very exciting things going on uh, for us here at FMB, and I, you know, I'm, I'm very thrilled about our positioning and where we sit, and you know, the quality of the portfolio and the work that our team has done. So, you know, I'd like to thank everybody for all of their contributions here at FMB, and thank you, our shareholders, for continuing to to invest in our company. Thank you. Take care, everyone.